ended up at Purdue in Indiana as assistant to the editor of a magazine called Modern Fiction Studies. And uh, so I spent a year sort of taking classes and sitting at a typewriter and uh, editing and doing things, being helpful. And then I got bored with Purdue and I went across the state line to the University of Illinois where I did a, an MA. Uh, in? Uh, well, I don't really know what it was in. It was sort of in the English department, but it was a combination of, this sounds absolutely bizarre, bibliography and, and uh, American studies. And I had a minor in theater, I think, I think I did. Anyway, I did a lot of plays and went, you know, wrote things. And all so you that. had the bug. Oh, yes, yes, yes. There's no doubt about it. I had that for years. But you were going to do something. You, well, it, you know, anybody that one spoke to said, oh, no, no, every silly theater, that's ridiculous. Get yourself a proper job, you know. So. And then I got a job. I was 24. I got a job as acting head of the theater department at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. <laughs> And uh, that, uh, that was really bizarre because I'd never really taken any of these theater courses. Like I had to teach acting and directing, so luckily there was a textbook. So I had to read one chapter ahead of the, the kids on how to do this. And I got the job because I'd spent two summers at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival uh, when I was a apprentice? student. Because at that time they took the Oregon Shakespeare Festival took students and teachers from American universities. They weren't a professional company at all, they were a training, training company. And so a friend of mine, a woman called Liz Hiller in, uh, at Illinois, had, had been there, had gone out one summer, and I thought, oh, that sounds like a very good summer job, you know, go out and do a bit of acting and wandering around in Oregon, I hadn't been there, so I applied and they said, yes, you can come. So I went out for one summer, and they kind of liked me, and they got me back for a second summer. So the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in 1957? 15, uh, wait a minute, let me think, I've got to think through this, 58, 59, 60 and 61. So I'd what say. kind of venue were they playing in? The, at the, uh, the big sort of reproduction version of, not the Globe, it's a version of the Swan, I think, that had already been built. Oh my God, wow. And it, it was lovely, it was good work, and there were very interesting people directing. B. Iden Payne, who used to run the Royal Shakespeare Company in the 20s, was one of the directors. Um, wonderful man, forgotten names really now, but uh, Robert Loper, who used to be the uh, professor at the University of Washington. A uh, wonderful man called Richard Risso uh, from Southern California, wonderful teacher and actor. And so they had very good people teaching these graduate students in theater. And I was one of them. Another one was, a um, name you might know, uh, Nagel Jackson, an American actor, used to run the Milwaukee Rep, directed in Russia, mm. those kind of things. And Elizabeth Huddle, that period, ended up at... Um, so that was the beginning of your training, so to speak. Yeah, it was the only training I ever had, really, apart from when I ended up at Stratford. Um, because I never took any classes or anything. I, I, I was, you know... I was very lucky. I had a nice voice. I was intelligent, and I, I instinctively, I could act. I hadn't got any craft, mm. but I could get on the stage, and people would listen to me. So then I had to learn the craft, but I learned it. I learned it on the job, I suppose. Right. And who were your mentors, your your inspirationals, so to speak? Well, one of the people that I mentioned at Oregon. Uh, I mean, one could say that there were. Lawrence Olivier and all those people, of course, that was film stuff, you know, you watched Olivier and you watched all these people and you thought, oh, I'd like to be like that. That was kind of showing off, though. It wasn't anything to do with acting. It was getting on stage like anybody can do and, and being a, you know, Canadian Idol kind of thing. Um, of people who taught me things, uh, this guy that I mentioned, Richard Risso, at, um, gave me a piece of direction that, that I still remember it. I was playing Bolingbroke in Richard II. And there's a tiny little scene where he goes around, thanks Northumberland, thanks Exeter for... One of those rubbishy speeches where you go, you know, thou to Chichester, Wessex, thou to, you know, one of those. And he said to me, no, 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 no. It, it's like a convention. It's like the Republican convention. You're saying, thanks very much, Minnesota. 
thanks a lot for all the help in Oklahoma, and so on and so And I went, oh my God, it means something. Right. I, it, it's one of those kind of clicks that bring things to the present. And I understood at that very moment what I was supposed to do, not in a large sense, I can looking back on it, but something hit me quite viscerally at that moment when I said, well, this play means something for now. It is now. And I understood that theatre only exists in the present time. Uh, now I can say that. I couldn't have said that, but that was the beginning of some understanding. So it was Richard Risso. And then John Hirsch, oddly enough, a bit later. Um, and you worked at MTC, early at MTC with John? Yes, but not with him. But in between there, my biggest, I think, was Mike Nichols, because I'd... <laughs> um, it happened, Maeve Moore and I had been in a science fiction half-hour CBC show. Called? Oh, God, I have no idea. <laughs> I played a mad bomber on a spaceship coming from Venus, and um, Maeve Moore was the United Nations ambassador to Venus. And coming back, I played the person who was going to bomb the, the terrorist. Uh, anyway, uh, Maeve kind of worked with me for the first time, and... Uh, He'd been asked, as he always was, you know, recommend me somebody quickly for various theatres. And he'd been asked to recommend somebody to go out to Vancouver when they had a festival at that time, which they thought was going to be like the Edinburgh Festival. And uh, they wanted somebody to play Algernon in The Importance of Being Earnest, and they wanted somebody to play Warwick in St. John, which is kind of ridiculous. Warwick's in his 40s. Algernon is 21 at most. Anyway, they landed on me. So I went out to Vancouver <laughs> and played Warwick in St. Joan with Mike Nichols playing the Dauphin. I know. It's a, and uh, <laughs> then it went on that he directed The Importance of Being Earnest. With Mike me, Nichols. Mike Nichols did with me as Algernon. And we got on terrifically. Um, we both hated the production of St. Joan we were in and, and we enjoyed doing The Importance of Being Earnest. He was very funny and charming and... And, and new things. He was, he was marvelous with Mike. And then uh, he asked me to go down and play in a show that he was doing in New York, and he asked me if I wanted to sit in on his first production, which was a thing by Neil Simon called Barefoot in the Park. So I sat in and watched rehearsals of Barefoot in the Park. And then he cast me in a production of a play by Angelico called The Knack. And um, Who did you play in The Knack? Ah, well, I was going to play Tolan, the guy who uh, gets the girls. But just a days before I went down, I came down with terrible tonsillitis and had to go into some mics here and have my tonsils taken out, so I didn't play it. Uh, and I was kind of disappointed. I thought, oh, fuck, that's my New York career down the tube. And uh, it was about six weeks later that I got a frantic phone call, again from Mike Nichols, saying, Chris, can, can you come down next, next week? Brian Bedford has to go out of the show, and you're the only person I can think of who can go in for him. So I said, w when do I have to go in? He said, well, mm, next Monday. <laughs> Something to that effect. And I said, when do you want me? He said, I want you now. So I said, oh, well, OK, yeah, I'll come down. I'm not doing anything. So I went down, and I went in for Brian. And then for a year, Brian... He was playing Tolan? No, Brian was playing... Colin. Co no, no, no. Well, who's the guy who paints? The one who runs it all. Um, right. I thought that was Colin. No, no, it. Colin is the nice one. That was Sam Waterston. Um, I can't remember what my name was. But uh, <laughs> anyway, this part, Brian and I sort of went in and out of for about a year. He'd get another job, and they'd call me up and say, could you come down and do this? And I did for about a year, backwards and forwards. It was fun. Let's talk a little bit about inspirational figures, because I've, I've never mm. thought of that before, that there are people in the arts who inspire us, and it mm. doesn't have to be our own discipline. And is it the voice of the person? I don't mean the physical voice. Mm. Is it the voice or is it what they say, like the man in Oregon who gave you that nugget that opened the door? Well, or some of it's, I think, very specific, like Richard Risso telling me what the theatre was about, like in two words, that it's, it's modern. But other people, it's, it's how they approach something, I think. And I, Mike Nichols was witty and alive and connected connected the past, he was well read. 
I seem to remember there was a Matisse hanging from the skylight in his apartment. I think it was a Matisse. It was something that I went, oh my God. Uh, and just that he surrounded himself with, with things which were very stimulating books and or he seemed to at the mm -hmm. time I'm looking back from some distance so he was an inspiration not only in the way he worked as a director he worked a, a, as an actor direct and that always interested me uh, in fact I came to believe that an, uh, that non actors had real difficulty directing and I still believe that actually um, so from that point of view Mike Nichols was very interesting John Hirsch, on the other hand, I admired the madness in him. I admired the fact that he would just go right out on a limb with Tom Hendry and start MTC, and that he had these ridiculous ideas. Um, and I just thought this is wonderful, that you're allowing yourself to this, this range of inspiration, if you like, in yourself. Why don't you do this, he'd say, or why don't you do that? Uh, I remember him calling me up at one point and saying, do you want, do you want to give up the theatre and be a critic? And I said, no, why? He said, well, the Ottawa Citizen wants a critic, and they've asked me who I'd recommend it. And I thought, well, you write. Do you want to be a critic? And I said, no, I don't want to be a critic. Said, Did you have any madness in your own life up to that point, or is that something Oh, that yes, no, no, it? mine has been, um, yes, it was a pretty peculiar uh, life as a child in a small way. I mean, I grew up during the war, so that, uh, and I grew up, or I was born on the southeast coast, the closest part to, to France. So, I mean, you just looked out to sea and there was France on a clear day. So, everything was moved when I was a child, uh, that barriers were put up all along the seafronts and uh, things closed. And my father owned a chain of gas stations. So all his gas stations were closed because they didn't want the Nazis to, get, you know, have gas mm -hmm. for their, for their uh, tanks. So all those were closed, and in fact, all private vehicles were seized within 20 miles of the coast. So my father's car was taken away from him. Um, that was odd. And then we went to Wales during the war to get away from the bombing because we were right on the coast. And that was interesting in itself. And then crossing, we'd go home for Christmas, so we, we crossed London, and there were always bombs falling and, and hiding in shelters and things like that it happened. So that was an interesting life. But and it must set you up for a different key signature. I mean, it, there is a generation of, of say, theater artists in this country who actually, who, who had some formative roots in a war setting, a country yes. of war, as opposed to my generation and the new generation that is, you know, free from that. Well, I'm not sure that it, I think it needed, I would have needed to be older to really place this, because war was the only thing I knew. And I mean, I can remember so many places, people saying, well, there will, there will be bananas after the war. There will be ice cream after the war. One lived in a, one lived in a war. That was the most natural bent, <laughs> that you went into an air raid shelter if you heard bombs coming over. Um, or the siren went. Uh, it was natural, and then the war stopped, and you hoped for ice cream immediately, and of course it didn't arrive. That was the bad thing that happened. Um, but I was lucky, and I, I had very good parents. Uh, when I was 15, I think, I can't remember whether it was 15 or 16, but this is it, it's 15, it's more romantic. Um, I, I must have been going through a very bad period at school, and in fact, I think I was bottom of the class and not doing anything that was typical of that period. Of, boy's life particularly. Anyway, my father, for my birthday, said, uh, gave me a new bike. Well, it wasn't a new bike, it was an old one, but second hand is new to me. And a ticket to Ostend in Belgium and 10 pounds in traveler's checks and said, oh, okay, we don't want to see you for a month. So I was I'd driven down to Dover and I got on the boat to Ostend and practiced my French on the boat and arrived in Ostend and found that they spoke Flemish, of course, so I immediately translated into my bits of German, or close to. And I cycled to Paris and uh, sort of made my own way and arrived in Paris. I learned more, more French swear words on that trip than I, I could possibly even remember now.